Do I just start? No. Hey guys, my name is Ten, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about protobufs, or you know, protocol buffers, which is probably the transfer protocol you've probably never heard of. So today we'll talk about what kind of data transfer problems there are when uh, architects are starting to create a new project. Briefly talk about you know, the current uh, data formats that we're familiar with, JSON as well as XML, which is another popular one. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about what protobufs are and their advantages, general structures of the protobufs and its current relevancy. So when a project is taking off, the first thing that many, one consideration that you have to consider is um, what kind of protocol should we use? And kind of in relation to that, what kind of format should the data be in? Um, and for the purposes of this talk, we'll be mostly talking about um, the format instead. So there's a lot of different uh, ways that data can be transferred. And something that is always in consideration for any project is the size of the data, as well as the efficiency and lightweight transmission um, considerations. And lastly, we also need to think about what is the requesting server using the data for. We've mostly been working with the web apps, so the, the, the requesting service is usually the client, but sometimes within companies there's gonna be internal transfer of data. And at that point, do you really need, um, you need to consider that, and there's different advantages and disadvantages to different format for those. So JSON and XML are two of the things that we're, um, two of the data formats that we're mostly familiar with. JSON is JavaScript object notation. XML is extensible markup language. And the main advantage of these two is how easy it is for the human eye to read and understand. So this is a sample XML, and we can easily see that, um, you know, this is a note. This data is representing a note. It has a to, a from, uh, the heading, as well as the, um, you know, the, the values of the fields, which is great for the front end, especially since, uh, you know, human, the more human readable it is, the easier it is to understand and use. But what about backend server to server communication? And this is a JSON file. I'm sure you guys seen this. So in come protobufs, which is, stands for protocol buffers. This is Google's creation in 2008. And it's still currently mostly used for their server communications, internal server communications. Um, it was actually created with XML in mind in terms of speed and efficiency. So they wanted to create something for themselves that would be faster than the normal standard XML, which is used mostly in like uh, HTTP calls, which is why when we have body parser, we always use something like URL encoded because XML is uh, the main way to do it. Um, lastly, protobufs are language neutral, which is good because it allows us to compile protobufs into many different backend languages like Java, C, Go, Python, etc. So how do protobufs work? Well, it's because they work by through binary serialization, which means they encode the data into and compress it into a binary stream, which is extremely lightweight and easy to transfer. They use a predetermined schema in order to encode and decode. So the message first goes in the encoder, and then the decoder uses that same schema in order to decode the message. Kind of adds like a layer of security on top of everything. And as, as I've said before, it can be compiled into many different languages. Actually, something to note is that Node is not officially supported, but someone created an MP library for it. So this is a sample schema of what a protobuf schema is. Um, you can see keywords that tell whether it's required or optional, data types, um, aliases, as well as number indicators. And, you'll, and these number indicators will be apparent what they're used for in the next slide, which is essentially these are what protobuf messages look like. They're all just number encoding. Each number represents an alias that only the schema itself can be can use to crack the code. So yeah, just to reiterate, iterate. 
schemas are a field that are indicated with an alias with a number, tag, and a data type. Um, you can have keywords such as required, optional, or repeated. And schemas also allow messages to be extensible. So which means kind of similar to how if we have an animal prototype and a cat prototype, cat can inherit the animal prototype. Similarly, a search response can inherit the, the result message schema. So advantages of these protobufs is how lightweight they are. They take up less space, and because they take up less space, they're faster to transmit. Um, using schemas, you have automatic uh, validation of your data objects, which, you know, this way you don't lose the integrity of your data model with uh, the kind of data, uh, with uh, whatever you send to the requesting server. And it's easy to modify the schema. Um, if you wanted to remove a field, all you do is have to change that alias to be reserved, and you know that field is removed, and no one else can ever use that field again. So this is just a quick graph to kind of show. Um, down here on the bottom is your average wait time for JSON to XML objects, and protocol buffers are here. Thrift is a newer model. Uh, I don't know too much about those, but they're apparently really fast as well. But something to note is that the server capacity is a lot higher for these um, faster transmissions because of the encoding. So to kind of show you guys how roughly how quick they are, uh, okay, you cannot see this. So here we have, we have a sample kind of uh, data structure that we want to encode, decode, and you know, measure out the times to encode and decode. And then we also will do the same thing with the prototype, protobuffer style. Um, yeah, so we're going to compare the stringify and the parse as well as the message, as well as the proto bu protocol buffer encoding and decoding. And just for the sake of time, okay. you can see that it's actually, so the protocol buffers uh, encodes in rough, a little bit more time than it does to stringify. But to decode, it's a lot faster. And the overall time for encoding and decoding is also a lot faster. And you can, only, you can think of this difference being a lot more magnified as data structure grows bigger and bigger. screen this. Anyways, but you guys have mostly never heard of this, so you're probably asking why now? Well, the answer is because of this. So this game, you know, the game that set you back 20 years or so, um, is created, created by Niantic. Niantic is previously an internal Google startup, recently spun off a couple of years ago, but because of that, they've been using Protobus for their data transfers. Um, and as with any wildly popular game, anyone's, there's lots of people trying to figure out how to hack it, how to cheat the game. And so a lot of people are setting up using mobile scraping to kind of intercept all this, all these protobufs. And with enough protobufs and enough data, you can kind of reverse engineer the entire library. So this is a sample of Pokemon Go protobuf that someone has uh, scraped. This is uh, in base64 encoding, which is not hard to decode into this which is an un, uh, undecoded, uh, it's an encoded protobuf. And with enough data, they were managed to get this. This is the map cell schema, which essentially tells you where all the Pokemon are at that area, what Pokemon is uh, available, and what nearby Pokemon there are. And so how are they doing that? Well, one way is they're doing uh, something called minimum attacks, which is man in the middle. It's essentially, the attacking computer tricks your, com your client into thinking that they are the server by presenting a fake authentication. Um, and then the victim, essentially your phone, just sends your data over and then they intercept it and then they would relay it onto the server so both of you guys would have no idea that this attack was happening. 
Um, one way that you can you can uh, circumvent this kind of thing is called certificate pinning, in which you tell the client that only trust this signature from this uh, company. But unfortunately, Niantic didn't actually do that. First. So all this data was leaked. So, but at some point, they, they figured it out. They closed that loop, and they also added more fields, unknown 6 and unknown 22, into the protocol buffer. And so these basically broke all the APIs because all the APIs were not expecting these. Um, but with any kind of you know, game, there's always people working tirelessly to break it. And it actually just took three days to break it. And now everything's back up and running again. So what else can um, Pokemon Go do? They can rate limit, which is essentially limiting the amount of requests that a client can make per minute per interval. And this essentially allows them to limit the amount of data that these hackers can work with. Certificate pinning, um, mentioned before. IP blocking, which is a lot of these hackers would use things like DreamHost to kind of um, wire their, their attacks through. And I mean, you can, you can kind of guess that most people who are actually playing the game probably aren't playing it through DreamHost. And just in general behavior analysis, if people are you know whipping all over the world in like two seconds flat, they're probably not playing the game for real. And uh, that's it.